Okay, now this is uh, Gail Ripplinger. Here she's doing a, a lecture concerning the NIV and NASB uh, Bibles, the New World um, Bibles, vis-a-vis -vis the King James Version. Now, there's a point in what's being said by her and other researchers. Both in her research in particular, there is a certain amount of what we'll call mixed fruit. And she appears not to really do her work so diligently, but she has brought to light certain things that other writers also prior to her and even after and during her time has also brought to light. But she has gotten most of the popularity in certain Christian circles for her King James only um, perspective or King James only stance. Now, the King James Version, if anything, that we notice that many of these ones and ones overlook is the fact that they have Holy Ghost in the Bible instead of Holy Spirit. And that right there can be seen, especially from a more scriptural perspective, recognizing that a ghost is a ghost. Even Christ says in the very King James Bible that he is he is no ghost. But yet, of all the um, corrections in the King James Version, very few on both sides of the argument even speak about that. But what we're going to do right here is we're going to... Um, Rewind this and let you get a fuller context of this particular uh, this particular message concerning the um, the shepherd of Hermes. Some inaccuracies that she presents, which really throws a lot of dispersion on what she's saying, it gives the enemy argument those who are in favor of a good Bible or proper and accurate Bible translations. So this is some of the the some of her research will consider it as a uh, uh, mixed wealth, mixed wealth. Some understand exactly spiritually, metaphysically, what that means. But let's go into it. One card. So for the people who aren't reading the New Bible version, uh, becoming indoctrinated with the concept of the one or he, um, the media is introducing this to people. Now, there are a group of Jesus seminar scholars out west. And I'll give you a quote of what they said. They said, quote, if you think you have everything in your Bible you need, we don't. Okay, they're going to add some things. I want to tell you what they're going to add. They want to first don't miss the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, we have all of our warnings about the, the whore of Babylon and the mark of the beast, so they've got to omit that. In its place, they want to introduce something called the Shepherd of Hermes. Now, the Shepherd of Hermes is in the Greek manuscript, Sinaiticus underlying the New International Version. So if the New International Version translators were honest, they would have translated the Book of Hermes because it is a part of their text in the Sinaiticus Manuscript. My contention is if someone doesn't know what books belong in the Bible, how can they know what words belong in the Bible? But anyway, the Book of Hermes tells us, number one, take the name. There it is, the name. Take the name of the beast. Number two, give up to the beast. Number three, form a one-world government. Four, kill those not receiving the name, not receiving the name, kill them. Remember in Matthew it says, the time will come and they think that whosoever killeth you says God's service, okay? The book of Hermes actually tells people, kill those who won't receive the name. When they add the five of the Bible, there will be people in churches reading this thinking, oh, we're to kill those who don't receive the name, and then they'll be out after, you know, looking for Christians there. Now, um, that's one thing that they want to add, Shepherd of Hermes. The other thing that they want to start adding are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, well, let's, let's, let's pause it right here. She's made, uh, Gail Ripplinger has made an accusation, in fact, against a very reliable book, perhaps in a Eurocentric mistranslation, as we found so many things. There's a, a Slavic book of Enoch. If you compare that with the Ethiopic book of Enoch, you'll find that there are two different Enochs. In fact, there's two Enochs in the Bible. There was one who was the son of uh, Seth and therefore the son of Adam. And then there's an Enoch who's actually the son of Cain. So name similarities should not fool us. We should judge a tree by its fruits. But here, Gail Ripplinger makes one of her classic Michelle Bachman kind of mistakes. 
you know, was saying, and we're going to now touch on exactly what she's saying. She made a couple of accusations. Let's, let's bring this, let's bring this over here. All right, let's bring this over here. And here is from what we call a brief document that we call Shepherd or Hermes, the Shepherd misquotes. This is a working kind of draft. And here you see where it says, um, Right up here, this is page, this is a excerpt from a page 15 of this document concerning Shepherd of Hermes and concerning um, Gail Rippling, the woman who we just featured at the beginning of this um, segment here. So here's new version Greek manuscripts, what they call the Aleph Manuscript, KJV, King James Version, the Greek Manuscript. Now, the writer of this, and we've done our own cross-checks and comparisons, because within the Ethiopian church, which is an ancient church, and also notice that one of the verses that the new Bibles, the New World Order Bibles, New Age Bibles omits, is Acts of the Apostles, chapter 37, which is the Ethiopian eunuch's testimony, the Ethiopian church, the Ethiopic church testimony. They they totally omit that because they say in certain manuscripts it does not appear, but they don't tell you that the manuscripts that the New Age Bibles utilize were rejected and corrupt manuscripts in and of themselves. This is when that New Age, New World Order kind of thing that was creeping in back in those days, and it was it was, it was overpowered because people kept to the received and the true word, and it was disseminated across many ancient Christian lands, mainly North Africa and throughout Africa. The East Africa was all Christian. Um, history, true history bears witness of that. So the Ethiopian and the Ethiopic testimony is very important. Now, the Shepherd of Hermes, we found out, was one book in particular that, his Imperial Majesty was said to um, read off or was, was familiar with reading this particular book. So when we heard this, we was like, well, what they mean, Shepherd of Hermes, is this kind of text that says give up to the beast and do all this. And we've heard a lot of people regurgitate this, this blasphemy or lie against the true and the authentic documentation known as the Shepherd of Hermes. So, it was interesting to find someone else had already taken Gail Rippling on this particular point to task. This is not to dismiss some of the other points that she regurgitates in her video and also documents in some of her work. Some of them is accurate, but the King James Version of the Bible is the more accurate structurally with the ancient manuscripts, but it's, it's not perfect, and there are certain areas and things that they should um, correct, but they have not. And one classic example is the whole ghost and holy ghost thing. By calling a ghost the disembodied spirit of a dead person. You know, the disembodied so-called spirit of a dead person. Christ clearly, Jesus Christ, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, clearly states that he is no ghost. But then this word creeps in, and throughout all the different Bibles and translations and notes, we find that all of them just uh, overlook that key aspect. Perhaps it's because of certain familiarity with ghosts, you know, within the Western Gentile whitewash sort of perspective cast but a friendly ghost he's white but the other kind of spooks are, are black so perhaps racism has has clouded their their spiritual hearts and mind but let's go into this right here on page 15 concerning the shepherd of hermes we found that this is a very important point because if one were to say watch that portion of the video or watch the video and we're seeking to put together certain certain um, video and independent study type material for ones who want to learn or get some basic foundations on certain particular subject matters. And Bible translations is a very important subject matter. So um, here we go. Let's get into the Shepherd of Hermes. Right here, New Version Greek Manuscripts, the Aleph Manuscript, um, King James Version Greek Manuscript. Now, 
she, Gail Ripplinger, the woman who we just showed you a couple of excerpts of, makes it appear that the newer translations slavishly follow the Aleph manuscript when Aleph is never followed unless it agrees with other manuscripts. These are some things that are, should be known to anyone who's, who has studied this, and we've come across this as well. Now, this is not endorse these New World or these New Age Bibles with uh, 666 um, modus or modality or sigil or whatever like that, or the unholy ghosts or whatever fake trinity or fake Jesus antichrist they're dealing with. But this is just a point of truth. Now, the Shepherd of Hermes, she implies that such writings as the Shepherd of Hermes and the Epistle of Barnabas are thought to be canonical by the newer translations when they are contained in none of them. These are early um, sub-apostolic uh, documents, you know, like letters and like documents and, and, you know, people writing to one another, you know, like, like emails, you could almost say in that sort of sense personal, private communication, not epistles or gospels in that sense, especially the Shepherd of Hermes, but more of a testimony. But she is a master of the art of, quote, guilty by association. This is one of the reasons why we had said she has that sort of Michelle Bachman or Sarah Palin. She come from that sort of um, um, white girl, white Christian school of thought. She may be correct with certain things, and where she is, we give due credit. But here is a blatant and a flagrant error from someone who should have known better. This is why we have to study and show ourselves approved. She is a master of the art of guilt by association and seems to imply that the inclusion of these writings in the Aleph manuscript is tacit approval of their contents. The Aleph manuscript is so ancient that it predates the formation of the New Testament canon. It contains books that were considered inspired by some churches, but were eventually excluded from the Christian canon. Now, that one point right there is, is really, really important to get the context and background. When it says it's very ancient, that means the earliest churches, before there was a so-called Roman Catholic church or before there was a pope or one's uh, Constantine telling people what is so-called orthodox, what is straight thinking and what is not, the early churches, many of the early churches considered the books inspired. But later on, they were eventually excluded from the latter Christian canon, and might we say the Roman Catholic canon. Parenthesis, open parenthesis, just like the 1611 King James Version had the Apocrypha included, which eventually was dropped by the vast majority of Protestants. Now, the original reasons why many of these books were dropped or were not used in the official canon is because they tend to contain matters that it's first necessary to have a basic foundation of. You know, everybody want to read the, the book of Enoch, figure that there's some secrets there that are not contained or would not be known if one go from Torah or from Genesis and and, and, and Exodus and Leviticus Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and Joshua and Judges, and you get a basic foundation. As Christ taught, Christ said, don't you know the scriptures, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms of David. That's the basic here to open up their understanding. They were familiar with other apocryphal, so-called apocryphal books like Ethiopic Enoch is very clear. But in a, many of these same documentaries and, and lectures, uh, it seems like a lot of the so-called mainstream white European Anglo-American Christians like to avoid um, the Ethiopian testimony, even though 
when you get into the works themselves and you start to read and peruse these works, they will refer many times to how the Ethiopic is very accurate along with the most ancient Hebrew. Even sometimes they even say it's more accurate in certain cases. But whenever you watch these shows or recordings, they would avoid that. But anyway, Miss Ripplinger also misleads the reader by selectively misquoting passages from these books totally out of context. And this is what she just did in this particular area where she quotes where she quotes um the Shepherd of Hermes totally I mean blatantly and flagrantly you know flagrantly out of out of context. Let's just, okay, we had, all right, uh, let's go forward. All right, no, we had, we still the video, but we'll get back into that, that portion, get back up to that portion in just a moment. All right, so let's go on with finding out how Gail uh, Ripplinger, how, because the whys, she would probably have to answer if she chooses to answer. But most people might, might, you know, get cocky on false pride because she has revealed some things which are accurate about the the NIV, the NASB, and these New World Order, New Age versions, Antichrist versions of the Bible, and about the relative accuracy of the King James Version. But also, there are some uncertain inaccuracies in the King James Version, but far, far, far less. You understand, in most of the older Bible uh, materials like we use in our studies, like the Schofield, um, the Schofield Reference Bible, uh, but we caution ones against the Schofield Reference Bibles, the NKJV. That is, because that use a, a corrupt, there's a corrupt text there, and we have some documentation that we'll share where ones can really get into this, because having a good Bible is very, very important. It's one of the, it's one of the fundamental things that is, that is necessary to us at, at the very outset. So part of Satan's, it's part of the plan is to remove the sword or to dull, to dull the edge of the sword for Christians. Now, whether ones like Gail Ripplinger are doing these things purposely, or whether this is a oversight or overzealousness or not, we cannot answer that. But what we do seek to speak on is this particular book, The Shepherd of Hermes, which is known among among our fellow Ethiopian Christians for countless centuries. And when we study it, it agrees with... Okay, right here. She's going to talk on this. It agrees... Oh, man. All right. We went a little bit... Went a little bit fast forward again here. So what we'll do, we'll bring that one up to date, and let's just continue with this right now. So, all right. So anyway, one wonders how she could have read the passages herself, unless she picked this up somewhere else and decided to print such misrepresentations of their contents. Now, these examples concerning what she has done is very, very glaring. I mean, one, you can... And not, and not even one you can really um, overlook. You understand? So she she's taken certain things, as we mentioned from the first part of the video. You understand? And she's taken it totally out of context. Let's give an example of how the shepherd of Hermes has been taken out of context. And once again, this is not to so-called beat up on um, uh, Gail Ripplinger. Um, we give thanks that, you know, that she has done the work that she has done, but it's not without um, um, needing correction. In other words, the word says iron sharpen iron as a brother sharpens his count the countenance of his brethren. 
You know what I'm saying? So this is, like we say, once again, this is not to beat up on um, Gail Rippling, because there's a lot of other ones, even I think the compiler of this article here, that does feel more inclined to beat up on Gail Ripplinger because of these, because of their 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 response to these these omissions, and I I, I must say, it, it begs the question as it's asked. One wonders: did she did she read these passages herself, and did she decide to print such misrepresentations of their contents after reading? these passages herself, she makes some good points. So look forward to that that uh, independent study package of the videos and, and additional materials that we're seeking to um, get available. Some of the videos probably, this one will probably be available along with the Walter Viet because it's very important that people get a, a firsthand, you know, a firsthand um, um acquaintance with some of the basic the basic materials and then they can, you know, um study up as they like. So here we're gonna go from the Aleph manuscript. In the Aleph manuscript it says, quote, I gave myself, right? Shepherd of Hermes omits up to the beast. Right? Now this is taken totally out of context. That's what's the, that's what she's written. That's what Gail um, Rippling has presented in her presentations concerning the the NIV and the, and the New Age, the New Age Bible, and and in her book, you know, which we think is also important important materials. And there's others who also kind of deal with it a little more accurately than has gone over her work and has taken out some of the inaccuracies because the inaccuracies they impinge her argument or the argument for a good Bible or a good translation of the Bible and is somewhat fanatical because the King James Version has some glaring um, mistranslations. One of them is calling the Holy Spirit, for example, the Holy Ghost. A ghost is a ghost and a spirit is a spirit and this is this is this is like spirituality. This is Christianity, like one on one, one on one. If you don't know the difference between a ghost and a spirit, then any old ghost pretending to be a spirit can fool you. So that's one main place that we've noticed, and we've continually remarked on this, because people say, "Oh, the King James is the best," and doesn't have no fault, and they become something like these fundamentalists. You understand, like the Tea Party, terrorist party, they become very fundamentalist and beyond rationality and beyond sound reasoning. The scripture says that we are to deal with sound reasoning. So this is taken totally out of context because what Hermes is saying, and now get this, please pay attention to this because we're going to contrast this with what she herself has um has you can hear that is in the Greek manuscript Sinaiticus underlying the new international version. So if the new international version translators were honest, they would have translated the book of Hermes because it is a part of their text. The Sinaiticus. Now, hold on for a moment. She's saying uh, if they were honest, all right, because she, she's in the argument about between the King James Bible and these new international version, so forth and so on, um, New Age Bibles, and which is a, a very valid argument. It's a valid argument. But now, get this. She took this now, saying that what the Shepherd of Hermes says is that, and you can hear her say this, that Shepherd of Hermes says to give yourself up to the beast, in a sense to take the mark, you understand? And some additional things she says as well that we don't have a rebut in this, but these two, when you see this, this taken totally out of context, because what Hermes is saying is that through trusting in the Lord, through trusting in Adonai, through trusting in Adonai Yeshua, he was not afraid to give himself up to tribulation, which is a very, very important point. This is patience is the what of the saints? 
agreeing with Revelation, symbolized, which is symbolized scripturally by the aure, by the beast. Here is the, the exact context. Quote, having therefore, brethren, put on the faith of the Lord, the faith of Adonai, and called to mind the mighty works that he had taught me. I took courage and gave myself up to the beast. Now, notice what the context of that is. See, if you just focus on this, I took courage and gave myself up to the beast and stop it right there. You understand? Not that I gave myself up to the beast. I took courage gave myself, see what they did, they, they've done this elsewhere. They would take this part out, took courage, and and then connect it as those I gave myself up to the beast. So the, they won't put the book of Shepherd of Hermes there. It's a bad book and there's no value to it. But yet the earliest of the Christian communities utilized this book, and that's how the, the, the church grew. You understand that there's even a church or a gospel because this early community recognized the true value and wasn't caught up by out-of-context um, either misrepresentations, as Gail Ripplinger does in, this partic in her particular book and, and other lectures. It's my contention that someone doesn't know what books belong in the Bible. How can they know what words belong in the Bible? But anyway, the book of Hermes tells us, number one, take the name. There it is, the name. Take the name of the beast. Number two, give up to the beast. Number three? Four. No, right there. She says, give up. You heard it. It says, give up to the beast. Give up to the beast. Now, she even changes the context of the sentence. Not saying that even if this one gave himself up to the beast, without the greater context here concerning, what, what, what does Hermes say? Having therefore brethren. Speaking to the brethren, put on the faith of the Lord and call to mind the mighty works that he had taught me. I took courage and gave myself up to the beast. Now, there's more. The beast was coming on with such a rush. This is what we're witnessing right now. This is very, very interesting, and it's very, very relevant. And, and a good translation is very necessary to, to understand and to understand it in context. Now the beast was coming on with such a rush that it might have ruined the city. It might have ruined the city. I come near it, and huge monster as it was, it stretched itself on the ground and merely put forth its tongue and stirred not at all until I had passed by it. Hermes chapter 1 verses 8 to 9. Now, as we said before, this book is known in Ethiopia, one of the ancient, um, one of the first um, of the nations to follow the Christ, to follow Jesus, to follow Yeshua. Okay, let's go to this. Cause this reminds me of um, when his, you know, his majesty's, this book was one of his majesty's um, favorite books. I don't know if it's Catch a Fire. It might be in, in the word Catch a Fire, or it, it perhaps might be in um, one of the, one of the other books. You know, this reminds me of this reminds me of his Imperial Majesty. There's a video where his Imperial Majesty had after the after the war and after Italy had stolen certain things, his Majesty refused any kind of official um you could say um business on a certain level, much less any visits after that betrayal that both uh people and priests had given Tefari or Rastafari, Kadamawi Hala Selassie, and plus Italy refused to return um, the stolen Ethiopia art and facts. But when I when I consider this picture here, if you consider this picture here, right? I consider this picture here, it is very interesting, this particular picture that you're seeing in front of you. Here's a visit where his Imperial Majesty Hala Selassie had met 
of the Pope. Now, this there's a whole backstory to this concerning how his imperial majesty refused refused to go forward um, um, because Italy still did not um, meet its post-war debt, being the the defeated and being the the one who had violated, being the violator against um, Ethiopia's Christian dignity back at that time, the fascist invasion. Now, this is also very interesting because you can see the handshake is basically a normal handshake, no funny little Freemasonic handshake. But now when you think about the Shepherd of Hermes, I want you to think about his Imperial Majesty's visit um, to um, Quirinelli, the Quirinelli Palace. People say he went to the Vatican. He didn't go to the Vatican. He went to Quirinelli Palace. Now, let's just go over this part of the Shepherd of Hermes again. We wanted to actually give a, a visual, a picture, a representation. There's also a black and white video. Let's just go over this one more time where it says, Having therefore, brethren, put on the faith of Adonai, the faith of the true Lord, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and called to mind the mighty works he had taught me, I took courage and gave myself up to the beast. Now the beast was coming on with such a rush. When you look at the Catholic Church during this particular time of the 60s, I mean, this is when Vatican II came out. They changed a lot of stuff. I and mean, even diehard Catholics said, what's going on? Why are they doing all of this? You know what I'm saying? The, the beast was in confusion. The beast was coming on with such a rush that it might have ruined the city. When I read this in spirit, I thought about Addis Ababa for a moment. I thought about Ethiopia. I thought about his majesty in the position of the shepherd of Hermes. And we would also have Hermes Trismegistus in the similarity of name and of metaphysical spiritual wisdom. And it says, I come near it. And huge monster as it was. Isn't the Vatican, in that sense, a huge monster when you understand it from the mystery side of it? It stretched itself on the ground, in the earth, and merely put forth its tongue. And stirred not at all, it stirred not at all until I passed it by, Hermes 1, 8 to 9. And it would be towards the end of the visible reign that such picture as you are witnessing right here with his imperial majesty meeting um, the pope. I forget which particular pope this particular pope is. And there's also, as we mentioned before, there's a video where Matthew goes there in full regalia with sword, and he gives a, 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 a speech, he gives words, and it's translated. And it's a very, very interesting, it's a very, very interesting piece of footage. I think someone has it out there where it says either his majesty went to Rome or his majesty met with the pope. But it was not at the Vatican. It was at Quirinelli, what's known as Quirinelli Palace for all official business. And if you go into the history, how his majesty refused because Italy still had stolen art and facts, stolen from the fascist aggression against Ethiopia, that it did not return. You understand that it did not return. And, and other things, Italy had to really acknowledge its um, fault. And to some degree, that was done. But it's interesting, this part from the Shepherd of Hermes, especially seeing that this particular um, book from our research, was one of the particular or favorite books of His Majesty. When we heard Gail Ripplinger say what she said, we had to check it out for ourselves. And when we had found the context, the context different than what she said, it was shocking. And there's a little bit more. The Book of Hermes tells us, number one, Take the name. There it is, the name. Take the name of the beast. Number two, give up to the beast. Number three, form a one world government. Four, kill those not receiving the name. Not now, this sounds like some some kind of um, right wing evangelical kind of, uh, you know, you know, almost like how they use. And even the writer of this makes a, 
you know, makes a point about Satan transforming himself, that she's coming off a good point, but now how this whole sentence was taken out of context, I gave myself up to the beast, and she's not putting as a command to give up to the beast. You know, saying without the clear context of this, the average reader surely assumes that the beast here refers to the beast in the book of Revelation. She's made that known. Miss Ripplinger doesn't clarify to the reader that this is not so, according to the context in the book of Hermes. You can project that onto it, but that's not what the context actually says. Miss Ripplinger is either woefully ignorant of the sub apostolic writings to whom she has made reference, or she is intentionally misleading her, I think we'll say readers or hearers. This writer would really like to believe the former, but there is way too much evidence of consistent willful deception here. And even though her video puts out certain data, like we was mentioning as we were watching the same video we showed you a little bit earlier that we played the audio in the background, she was going through some of her slides, and she would touch on a couple of points, and then, you know, you could read some of the other information there. And I'm like, well, how come she didn't touch on that? How come she missed that? It's like she brought presentation, and she kind of, uh, kind of hops around here to there. So we think this is also part of the consistent willful deception. You understand? If this writer were to be so naive, let's just say, you understand, not giving a benefit to doubt, but let's just say it be so naive as to still give her the benefit of the doubt and regard this as an unfortunate misquotation. The question then must be asked, how does this woman think that she has the scholarly wisdom to write a book about subject matter of which she has no expertise or to make such a blatant misquotation, misrepresentation, and not to take that, you know, not to not to take the evidence that we're showing you very clear. And there's, there's more. The Aleph manuscript. Let's let's go to this this part right here, the Aleph manuscript right here. Um, receive his name. Remember she said that? And the Shepherd of Hermes tell you to receive the name. Now you get other people who read what she wrote or listen to what she says and they go out there and say these things and have not found the truth for, for themselves. So you get to see why it is so important to speak up on this because receive his name, Shepherd of Hermes, omit. Now again, Miss Ripplinger takes this totally out of context. She makes it sound like Hermes has received the name of the beast. And if you listen to her, that's what she's saying. Far from it. Ayadimus. Read the whole quote. Let's read the whole quote together. The glorious man, saith he, it is the Son of God, and those six are the glorious angels who guard him on the right hand and on the left. Of these glorious angels, not one, saith he, shall enter into God without him. Whosoever shall not receive his name shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Another thing that they could take out of some of their Bibles is the un and unto and just have to God. That would be, you know, in the ghost thing. And besides that, maybe a verse or two that we can really say, you know, a couple of verses need to get a clearer, a clarification, you understand, in the King James, perhaps the 1611, so forth and so on. But definitely nothing like what the NIV or the NASB of the New Age Bibles has done more throughout. You understand? I mean, they are awful, they are woeful, and we do not recommend them for anything. And honestly, at best, maybe for... For, for a heating fuel or something like that. So people say, well, it's a Bible. When you really get a clear idea of the damage, besides keeping a couple for a testimony as like a judgment, like for as, as evidence, you understand? We would not, they cause more confusion. And what Miss Ripplinger does by saying that the shepherd of Hermes says to receive his name, 
and then you read this in this context that the glorious man is the son of God, then it mentions the six glorious angels who guard him on the right hand and the left, and of these glorious angels, not one saith he shall enter into God without him, whoso shall not, whosoever shall not receive his name shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Now, who's his name? How are you going to put the devil, Satan, here? When it's saying the son of God, the glorious man is the, the honorable man, is the Bain Ha Elohim. How could she do this? Isn't, it isn't the name of the beast. And whether she read somebody else's work and just plagiarized and then do her first-hand research, we don't know. But this is also clear that it is not talking about the name of the beast that Hermes is talking about. It is the name of Yeshua, Yehoshua. Jesus, Jesus, or who they call Jesus, and we ask, how many Z's are in Jesus? Does it not seem to the reader that, quote, something fishy is going on around here? Maybe it is an honest mistake, some would say. But this writer honestly doesn't see how a woman can claim expertise in the area and demonstrate such shoddy scholarship, and we say to say the least, shouldn't we expect a little more careful research than this when it comes to such an important subject, doesn't it? Okay, let's just go to page 16 right here. The next example destroys any respect this writer has for this woman's credibility and honesty. And we really agree with this writer here, based on the proofs and the double check of these proofs. However, we must also say that in her presentation, in her books, a lot of the information she has in there is accurate, but it comes down to be such a, a mixed, a mixed wealth, such a, such a mixed wealth that she should have done better and someone needs to, you know, replace the work that she did with something a little bit more accurate, take into task, you know, sense these these um amendments here. Because here she says, according to Life Manuscript King James Version, Satan dot 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 don't you not love it when they do this? Ellipsis is Lord. Almost like it, it, it's, it's like a subliminal suggestion in a sense. Epistle of Barnabas. This is on Barnabas for a moment. But the Epistle of Barnabas we thought was interesting, even connected with um, what's being said right here. Um, this is taken totally out of context because what pseudo Barnabas is saying is that, quote, Satan, ellipsis, dot, 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 is Lord of the season of iniquity that now is. That's what it's really saying. Not Lord over his life or ours, according to Barnabas 18, 1 to 2. Now, read the text and listen to the text in context. Quote, but let us pass on to another lesson in teaching. There are two ways of teaching and of power, the one of light and the other of darkness. And there is a great difference between the two ways. For on the one are stationed the light-giving angels of God. On the other, the angels of Satana. And the one is the Lord, the Adonai, from all eternity and to all eternity, whereas the other is the Lord of the season of iniquity that now is. Even in the original, the idea of Lord would be different. This Lord here, Satana or Satan will be the Baal in that sense. While our Lord, Adonai Yeshua, Geta Yesus, is the Adonai. But if you notice Barnabas 18, 1 to 2, does the reader smell a rat? This writer does. And this narrator here, documentarian, also does. Miss Rippling's credibility in all other matters is virtually destroyed. I mean, it, it impinges on that. And if, we, if one was not to look at everything else and you read this and you check it out for yourself, 
you might not even want to even even dabble with what what she's saying. And unfortunately, some of the things that she's saying is accurate. But thank the Almighty, other writers also are engaging this issue and avoiding some of her flagrant misrepresentations of both biblical and non-biblical literature. In a sense, because of her shoddy work, she almost it's almost like one can quote whether from King James version when it says, "I suffer, uh, I suffer not that a woman usurp authority over a man." You know, it, it makes you say that. You know, in other words, it 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 pushes studies because the first thing you'll be asking yourself, well, oh, okay, she made these errors. Why don't she just come up and say, you know, replace this? You know, then th there can be a different approach. With such flagrant misrepresentations, what can you say? Miss Rippling, as she's demonstrating a lack of knowledge of the history of biblical literature, and this is evident in her outlandish statement on page 537 of her book, where she asserts that the church father, Oregon, was the producer of the Septuagint. And what's so interesting, we've actually read other writers um, who have said this uh, elsewhere. Just recent, it's like, I don't know, this is a recent thing that's coming out right now? Because it's older writers who were even part of the whole King James compilation and preservation and who were, who were King James, you can say, fans among those Protestants that said something different than these New Age Christians are against the New Age Bible by talking King James only, but breeding a lot of confusion and misrepresentation. So she makes this outlandish claim concerning the Greek Old Testament. And unfortunately, some others who have just, um, you know, um, swallowed whole her work and not really checked out point for point. This is why we like to do our study, and sometimes things will sound good, but, I ha you know, I have to find some other evidence, you understand, or some independent primary evidence to go on. This is why I refer to the Ethiopic, because it becomes our primary evidence. The Septuagint LXX was produced around 250 B.C. 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 That's before the common era, of the Christ, before Christ, or the common era. But Christians believe it's before Christ, but really it's the common era. Oregon lived from 185 to 254 A.D. How in the world can he have written the Septuagint? If the reader needs proof that the Septuagint predates Oregon, he or she can merely turn to Hebrews 10 in the King James Version of the Bible. One need only to compare the Septuagint with Hebrews 10 and 5 to refute totally Miss Ripplinger's falsehood. And we heard it in this particular um, video. Though I think that some of, you know, the brothers and sisters need to become familiar with, with some of the main points and check them out for yourself. And both the manuscripts which underlie the King James Version and the ones that underlie modern versions read the same. The King James Version renders 10 and 5, which is a quote from Psalm 40 and 6 in this way. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. If the reader looks in the King James Version at Psalm 40 and 6, it says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Question, what is the difference? Because the writer of Hebrews, possibly the Apostle Paul, m many in the church ages believe so, was quoting from the Septuagint of Psalm 40 and 6, which says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And this is the Septuagint um, Brenton. You understand? How could the Texas Receptus and consequently, the KJV contain a quote from the Septuagint. After all, Mr. Ripplinger claims that Oregon wrote it, one of the early Christian fathers, so to speak. 
that he wrote it. If she is correct, then the letter to the Hebrews must be a third century writing. So you see what she's doing by that error? Because then somebody can say, okay, she's right about that. Therefore, the book of Hebrews is not from 250 B.C., you understand? The third century, so roughly um, um, B.C., but it's actually the third century A.D. You see what she's doing? You see what these kind of errors can cause? If Paul, Hawadia Paulos, authored the Hebrews, book of Hebrews, the epistle of Hebrews, which many believe or accept, and the King James Version goes so far as to say, then Miss Rippling could not possibly be right. As a Christian, this writer's practice is to believe or try to accept, trust, you know, trust but verify. You understand the best of, of people. He, he takes no joy in pointing out these inaccuracies in Miss Ripplinger's book, New Age Bible Versions. He would like to believe or I and I to accept as true that the falsehoods and inaccuracies in her books and also contained in her lectures that we had showed you a little bit earlier are merely typographical errors or mere oversights. But the overwhelming evidence is that this woman is a purposely dishonest <laughs> expletive deleted deleted satan is using her book to foster division and suspicion and more more we're going to add this to what the writer wrote here inaccuracies in the body of christ in a ministry prior to his current one the writer experienced personal attacks due to gail ripplinger and her ilk her kind i call her the michelle bachman kind he cannot simply stand by and watch fellow Christians being duped into, quote, pole vaulting over mouse droppings when serious work needs to be done to advance the kingdom of God. And then it goes further that this writer could go on and, and further in pointing out the flagrant misrepresentation misleading charts that are contained in Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible versions. To do so would require a book at least as long as her book. It is my prayer and it's our prayer that pastors, layperson, and laypersons who have faced personal attacks due to so-called well-intentioned yet very ill-informed followers of Miss Ripplinger will find ammunition here to defend themselves. It is also my prayer that Miss Ripplinger uh, 